My life's work is with the voice. I conduct choirs and work with the natural instruments that come out of human beings. I'm director of music at a First Unitarian Universalist congregation of Ann Arbor and uh, director for Saginaw Choral Society. And just the amount of long words in those titles means that I get into a lot of interesting conversations about the voice just about every day. And one of the ones that comes up most often is the conversation about the voice of the person I'm speaking with. Often someone will say to me, well, that's great that you make a career in music. Um, that's not something I can do. I don't sing beyond my shower walls. I can't sing. I'm not a singer. And I tell them, don't you know that your voice is powerful? And they say, well, it's nice of you to say. And every once in a while, I have the opportunity to sit down. And this is what I say. Because your voice is forever changing, you must sing forever. Because you are not who you were, and because you shall not be who you are, you must sing forever. Because your voice is like no other voice, and because your voice and my voice form the uncompromising strength that is our voice. And because with our singing, we save and change lives. Because with our singing, we are more powerful. And because with your singing, our singing is miles wider. We must sing forever. It was about six years ago when the singing of a people changed my life. I was the newly appointed director of music for the First Union Congregation in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I just moved here, and I had had that, you know the feeling, uh, that is wonderful excitement mixed perfectly with sheer terror, that same emotion that you get any time you do something new. And there I stood on the chancel and I looked at people, many of whom I had never met, trying to figure out what this church was about. You see, I grew up in a Christian church and a church largely in the gospel music tradition. I was not used to even having a piece of paper to sing from. We did everything improv. It was a completely different world than what I was experiencing right now. And I would figure out that it didn't just go to the paper. It went beyond in its differences. At my home church in Baltimore, Maryland, I had the privilege of all kinds of musical opportunities for which my family could never have afforded to pay, and they brought me to this position. As a matter of fact, my goal was to be a pastor of a large church where thousands of people would come and have their lives transformed and renewed because the church had loved and nurtured me so much and had given me such a passion. And all of my life in my teenage years was moving so directly with a remarkable clarity in that direction, with one huge exception. Back then, when I was a teenager, the conversation in the churches like mine across the country about spirituality and its relationship with homosexuality was becoming a hot button. Everyone was talking about it. You couldn't go a day without turning your television on or hearing in the Bible study a preacher with that authoritative, loving voice that you knew telling you that what you were was a curse and a choice that you had to change. I remember being around a circle of praying churchgoers and clergy members, praying that demonic spirit out of my body, that spirit of homosexuality, and there I stood outwardly silent, inwardly bruised, and entirely bewildered. By the time I got to the Unitarian Universalist congregation, I'll be honest, I knew hardly anything about it. So there I stood with my curiosities. The church had one more chance in my mind. 
I looked at the people all around with their smiling faces wondering, is this church really who they say they are? The inherent worth and dignity of every person. Oh, I've heard that before. But let's see. And Allison, our pianist, began to play the warm, optimistic chords that start the hymn for the morning. A hymn that I had never heard before. It's a delightful title. We are a gentle, angry people, and we are singing. Sing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry people, and we are sing, sing for our lives. I was singing that along with the congregation, but it wasn't until we got there that I realized that the author had penned a fifth verse on the next page. And all of a sudden, the voices joined together in a solidarity and determination that I had never heard before, singing, We are again straight together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are again straight together, and we are singing, singing for our Is looking for some hint of shock or timidity or embarrassment and having to sing those words, those scandalous, scandalous words. But in return, what I got was doctors and preachers singing, We are again straight together. Younger and older people singing, We are again straight together. All manner of people from all walks of life singing, we are again straight together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. They sang those words with determination in a world battling marriage equality, in a world of Matthew Shepard. They sang with clarity and vision, something I had never heard before. They sang with conviction in their hearts not knowing that what they were doing was saving and changing my life. They had sung something that I had never heard before. The truth is you have a voice like no one else's, a rhythm to your life so special because only you live in it. You bring with your voice your heritage, your history, you bring the spirit of those people who got together on the streets of Montgomery, Alabama and said, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. So that when you take the courage of your convictions and you mix them with the intention of beauty, you create a sound like no one else's. So you must sing. We need your voice. We need your story. And we need your being. Because your voice is like no other voice. And because you are not who you were, and you shall never be who you are. Because with our singing, we save lives, we must sing forever. <laughs>